Let us today we continue with part two of our study of the first chapter on self as refuge or the one refuge. No? Now, before we actually go into the text, which is on page nine, I would just like to say something about the importance of how Dharma study or, if, or home Dharma study, if you like. The first thing is very relaxed to come here and use your house to uh, st- study Dhamma, to make friends, and to be together. This is very important. This is a building of fellowship. Yeah? So once you have this and you find your friends, you don't just, you know, uh, go to the temple, learn, and then go back, and that's all. <laughs> like a zombie, you know? nothing happens. Eh? Here we build up camaraderie, fellowship. The, in the Dhammapada, there is a very beautiful saying Visasa Parama Nyati. Those you are familiar with are your relatives. Visasa means those you are uh, kind with, friendly with, open with, familiar with. Okay? People you can laugh with, with sasa. Yeah? Parama means the highest, the best. Nyati, relatives. So these are our true relatives. So what the Buddha is teaching us here is you have the biological family, small little family, father, mother, children. Now Singapore, is, the families are very lonely. You know? You've got father, mother, children, that's all. So now one son on him and a spoiled kid. And it's going to have a difficult future. We're going to be a very unhappy country go on like that. And we're going to celebrate 200 years <laughs> next year. Nah? So Buddhism has a lot to teach us. The biological family is not enough. Now in Chinese, the, the word for renunciation is chucha, go out of the house, right? So we have to, in a sense, we have to leave the biological family. And today we are doing that. This house is now open. Right? We are... Not all of us are related by blood here, but we are connected by the Dharma. So when a monk, when a nun leaves home or renounces the world, he doesn't give up his father, his mother, brother, sister. They are still his father, mother, brother, sister. He leaves the biological family, the concept of blood of biological family, but accepts a more open, global family. Anyone can come to the monk and nun and talk like father, mother, you have problems, you talk to them, they're ready to help you. So this is the Buddhist concept of the bigger family, the global family. So this is what a study like this can do. And we can build up this kind of fellowship. This is very important for society, you know, for Buddhist society. You, you become a more mature society. Otherwise, you feel lonely you know, during the important occasions of your life, birthday, funerals, weddings, and so on. So you have this connection. You know? And you, you, you have a problem, you have people to talk with, you're lonely, you have friends, and so on. Then, you know, in, in India, you hear this story about how Buddhism disappeared in the 11th century. You know, Buddhism was the most successful re- religion in India. You know? But then suddenly it disappeared. In China also, it disappeared. In Korea, it disappeared. In Japan, it disappeared. <laughs> but in Singapore, it's growing. Now, there are various reasons for the disappearance of Buddhism in all this country in Asia. We'll, we'll talk about it another time. We'll get a long talk here. I've written a whole book, a uh, very thick book, ne? called How Buddhism Became Chinese. It's a bit of the problem is discussed there. But i just like to say one thing on you. How come Buddhism disappeared from India in the 11th century, but Jainism did not? Now, Jainism is... But in a sense, in many ways, similar to Buddhism, you don't hear much about Jainism today because they're very strict. The Jains are a very small group of people. They are very strict vegetarians. Some, some of their monks are so strict, they cover their mouths so that they don't breathe in insects and kill them. 
And some of them, they walk, they will use a very gentle feather broom, you know, and gently sweep the floor so they don't step on insects or whatever little ends on the ground. They, they are that strict, you know. That's why it's very difficult to follow them. So what did, why did they survive? This group of very gentle uh, people survived, but the Buddhists did not. It, I mean, it, it was a very bad time, you know. This, the Turks, these Muslim Turks came down from Turkey across Iran and then came into India and destroyed all the temples because there are golden Buddha images, the monasteries are very rich. They knew this for centuries, they were keeping an eye on these temples in India. That's why they came. Then finally they came and then they destroyed the temple, they collected the gold. Many monks died, many ran away also. And Buddhism effectively disappeared within a few years. But Jainism did not. And the reason is very simple. One reason, okay, there are other reasons. This main reason is their lay followers studied their Dhamma, their teaching, Dhamma simply means teaching, in their own homes. So the Turks did not notice this. So you can see the importance eh, of home study. You are protecting the Dhamma. So don't think that you come and study, it's just a fun affair after these nice things to eat. Eh? It's not, <laughs> it's not just that. You are creating a very important practice here. Some people think that, oh, Buddhism only for monks and nuns to practice. Eh? Now, that's a very, very wrong idea. Okay, everyone is supposed to practice it. You know, nowadays, you find a lot of educated people, Westerners, you know, very serious about Buddhism. You know, some of our Buddhists here are not very serious, especially the rich Buddhists. Eh? They don't want to give up a lot of the nice things they are used to. For example, there was once we recited the five precepts, and suddenly the fifth precept, and the voice went down. <laughs> Can't hear, you know. <laughs> Later, we found out that some of them didn't recite it. <laughs> and he asked why. He said, because they drink. <laughs> so they said, we can't give up drinking, all right? So, uh, anyway, then it happened that, that one day, these people, they went out somewhere, they got some Western friends. They said, hey, come, let's have a drink, you know. Like they thought that was a way to entertain uh, foreign guests, right? But these are foreign Buddhists, okay? White man Buddhists, no? Then the Western Buddhists say, uh, no, no, I don't drink. And then our local Buddhists who drink, they are very surprised. They ask, why don't you drink? And the Western Buddhists say, because we are Buddhists. <laughs> I think that's the most wonderful lesson you can have. You see. So, the Western Buddhists are very serious. They are very serious about study. That's why the big universities are in the West. And now we are also picking up. Right? Singapore is becoming a very important center for education. Studying is very important. You want to survive, you want to thrive, you want to prosper. You can have all the money in the world. If you don't have education and wisdom, you will be limited by your wealth. No matter how much money you have, you will still be poor. You won't be happy. And get dementia faster. <laughs> well, yes, in Singapore, you have to be careful. Right? I mean, not in Singapore, everywhere. Where we age, our mind. You don't use your mind, you get dementia. The mind gets sick. Okay? We have a saying in our meditation classes, your mind... Use it or lose it. Your mind's like your body. You exercise, right? You find, wow, you're more healthy. You, you feel better. You feel happier. You can do sutta work better. And sutta work makes you happy. So you go back and forth like that. Okay? Right, so this study of Dharma, getting together like this, is wonderful. All right, so this is the first thing I want to tell you. Now, second thing, our theme here is the one refuge. Now, we used to think about three refuges, right? Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, which is true, yes. But ultimately, there's only one refuge, that is the Dhamma, right? And uh, the Buddha, before the Buddha passed away, he says, 
do, uh, take the Dharma as your refuge. Take yourself as your refuge. Actually, he first said, take yourself as your refuge. Take the Dharma as your refuge. Take no other refuge. Another way of, the meaning of this is to meditate. When you take refuge in yourself, means you meditate. You take your own refuge. Ne? When you take Dharma as refuge, the Dharma is outside you. But when you meditate, the Dharma is inside you. All right? So that's the one refuge. Do not take refuge in teachers. We don't take refuge in teachers. Because teachers, even when the teachers are awake, and you remember last week we studied the Arahat monks, you know, the tell their devotee, don't take refuge in me, take refuge in the Buddha. The Arahats, even Arahats say that. So imagine if Arahat say, don't take refuge in me, take refuge in the Buddha. Teachers, whether they are monks or not, who are not awakened, we should not take refuge in them. We do not take refuge in people. And further, you can also, important to understand, uh, you, we, we can call anyone our teacher, yes. But better than that, we say, we, have, we all have only one teacher. That's the Buddha. That way you'll be safe. You will not be disappointed. You know, nowadays you have all this uh, so called movement, what Me Too movement and all that. Uh, everybody will get into trouble sooner or later. And then suddenly they gossip about your teacher, and then you get disappointed with him, and then you get angry with him. Or some of your teachers say something in a lesson, and they say, Oh, yeah, my, my teacher is talking bad about me, and you get upset with it. And you cut off your Dharma roots, as we say. You get angry. You know? then you lose touch. All these are wrong views, you see. So never take refuge in a person. Take refuge in the teaching. If you take refuge in teaching, then you say, oh, the teacher is only saying something. He's not being personal. He's not saying bad about me like that. Okay. So that's the meaning of take refuge in the teaching, not the teacher. Because teachers, human beings, you can find faults. Even with the Buddha, also, people find faults with him. But the Buddha is different, right? Because the Buddha, when you see him, he embodies the Dharma. He who sees me sees the Dharma. What does that mean? When you see the Buddha, you don't really see a person. You see a very happy, radiant being, right? In that sense, he represents the teaching. And the Buddha also respects the Dharma first. That is why we have the Dharma even to this day, after 2,500 years. You know how long that time is? 2,600 years, actually, if you calculate from his birthday. Because the Buddha cared for us, he knew how to preserve the suttas, the teachings, so that it reaches us to this day. We can gather here and still study those teachings, the real teachings. If we don't have the real teachings, then whatever people say, we just follow blindly. And there are lots of gurus today, lots of false teachers today, a lot of fake teachers today. You go online, you, you, you go on the internet, you, you know that, right? And there are going to be laws against all these things. Can you imagine how serious it is now? So in other words, we must know the real thing. How do you know the real thing? Well, this is what I have been doing the last 16 years. I said, what is this Buddhist teaching? Right? So this is one of the volumes you can see, the Sutta Discovery. Right? The Suttas, these are the original, as close as you can get to the original teachings. Okay? In other words, when you study the Suttas, you can see the Buddha, how he practice, how he live, how happy he is, and so on. So in that sense, we should be truly grateful to the Buddha. And this is where we come to today's lesson. Gratefulness, okay? Page 9. Okay, look at the 1.4.4. Can you see that? Now, I like to use Pali because Pali is a very beautiful language, very exact, very clear. But don't worry, I will explain all these words to you, so slowly you get used to the original uh, language of the old language of the suttas. Ne? Now the title of this sutta is Katanyu. You see the N has got the mosquito baby at the top. Nya, 
partner is nya, ne? Kata nyu, and then you see the u got a got a line over it. The line over it is called a macron. Macron means make it big. So the u is pronounced long. Ooh, Pali is very easy. All the letters are pronounced exactly as they are. So u is pronounced as oo, not u. Oo, okay. And then kata. We D, so you can see the I. The I is not pronounced I. The I is pronounced E, short E. Here is long. There's a macron over the I, so it makes it long. E, two counts. Eh? If you know music, it is one, two like that. Two counts. And then suta. I'll start with the easiest word. Suta means thread, thread. Okay, because the sutas are like a thread. It goes back to the Buddha's time. The sutas are also like threads. The teachings are all. Threaded together, the words are threaded together, strung, strung together, a string of teachings. Then kata new. Notice you got kata and kata two twice, right? Kata here means what is done is a participle. No? What is done, kata. You know the word karma comes from the same root, right? Karma is the abstract noun. What is done. Kata also means what it, what is done, but slightly different meaning. And then new, okay? New means to know. To know, okay? Those who know what is done, kata new. Those who know what is done, those who acknowledge what is done. Right? So this is the first part of gratitude. Gratitude means you know, you acknowledge somebody has done something for you. This person helped me. This person was kind to me, and so on. Okay, so kata new, right? Now the difficult word is the next one, kata wedi. Okay, kata means what is done, same meaning, but wedi. Usually wedi also means the one who knows, but wedi has got another meaning. It means the one who is happy. Uh, this is uh, quite tricky, you know. Luckily, I did my homework once, you know, because this monk is a scholar monk. He was trying to trick me. You know. He said, uh, how you translate this word, eh? Wedi? Because the lesson I knew, Wedi doesn't mean to know. Wedi means to be happy. <laughs> so I said, oh, it means to be happy. And he was very quiet, he didn't say anything after that. So here, Wedi means to be happy. Okay, so put together, what do we get? Katanyu, the one who knows what is done, the one who acknowledges what is done, Number then, Tata Wedi, he rejoices in that fact. You are happy with that. You feel happy towards that person because the person was kind to you. So there, these are two aspects of um, gratitude in Buddhism. Okay, number one, you acknowledge something is done for you. Number two. You rejoice in it. Rejoice, very important. Joy is a very important teaching in Buddhism. You know, before I started the sutta, I don't hear much about teachers talking about joy. In fact, you find that people who can meditate, if you put joy into your meditation, you find it becomes easier. At home, we all have to wash dishes. You know, we all hate washing dishes. So you put joy into it, and after that we enjoy washing dishes, <laughs> you know? So if you don't hate it, you want to do it, you know? You enjoy it, you see? Alright? So don't say, you know why people don't like to do something? Because in their, in their mind they say, I don't like this, I don't like this, I hate this, I hate this. So of course they don't like it, you see? Right? So this joy aspect is very important in your meditation, uh, in your daily life. Joy also is loving kindness. So if you have loving kindness, you have joy, it's easier to keep the precepts. Easier to keep the precepts. Because if you are joyful, you see, oh, look at all those animals, they're so beautiful. You love them, you're kind to them, and you won't kill them, you won't hurt them. And then you respect people's property, you respect other people, you respect the truth, you respect your mind, right? The five precepts, right? So let's look at the teaching here. Kata nyu, kata wedi, sutta. The discourse on gratitude and reciprocation. It should be better is joyful reciprocation, if you like. Ne? So you also, uh, to be joyful means to reciprocate. 
Then A2.11.2, that's the reference where to look up the sutta. This numbering is very important, eh? otherwise we don't know where the teaching comes from. You can either remember the name of the sutta or the number. And the other numbers are simply the volume and page. Okay? Uh, I also put A, B there. That one is A, Anguttara, B is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. His numbering is different. You follow the, I think, Burmese numbering. Okay? And the next line says, theme. If your friend asks, hey, what is this sutta about? Then you look at the theme. Knowing kindness and gratitude. All right? Now, this is a very short teaching, only four lines. Bhikshus, uh, this is the English word for monks. Eh? Bhikshus in Chinese is Pichu. Okay? Pichu, okay? There are these two persons that are difficult to find in the world. What are the two? One who is first in kindness, Pubbakari. And one who knows kindness done and rejoices in the kindness done. Katanyu Katawedi. Right, so the Buddha says these two persons, big shoes, are difficult to find in the world. Okay, so this is what we should practice. The first difficult person to find is Pubba Kari. Pubba means before. Okay, Kari, dua. You see, Kari, kata, the ka, meaning to do. Kama, all same. Uh, root word. Pubakari, first to be kind to us. And who is this? This is our parents. Our parents are the first to be kind to us. That's why we are grateful to them. And then, uh, one who knows kindness, done, katanyu. And who rejoices in the kindness, done, katawedi. Right? If you rejoice, what do you do? You want to repay, you want to sh give back. Right? Occasionally you see in newspaper some of, someone who has become very successful, they say, oh, I want to pay back to society, something like that. It's gratitude. All right? So this is a beautiful teaching. Remember this, right? No kindness, acknowledge the kindness done to you. In your mind you say, okay, I know, I remember this. Right now I may not be able to give back, but one day may, when I can, I will. And you feel joyful about it. Don't feel bitter or anger. Don't say, oh, this guy is rich, he can help me and I can't. You just feel happy. You say, thank you. You say, sadhu. That's why we say sadhu. Okay? We say, very good. Sadhu means very good, excellent, appreciation. So we rejoice in the goodness done. Alright? So these are the two kinds of person how to find in the world. One who is first in kindness. That means, the meaning also is don't wait to be kind to others. Alright? When you can do it, you do it. And then the second kind of person is one who is grateful, remembering the goodness, also reciprocating. Alright? So the details are all given to you. The next page you can read by yourself. Ne? Lots of details here. I usually will write a lot of things, you can read up here and there, but in a talk like this, I will summarize for you, so that you are inspired to read all these extra notes. So the notes are always there, right? These notes are for teachers to read up, uh, for, for you to educate yourself, right? Because Buddhism is an educating religion. Ed ed educate means to bring out the best from you, okay? If you look at the educate, the Latin word, Etymology, that means how the word started. Eh? Educate, add, e means x, out, it means out, bring out. Eh? Do sere, to draw out. Okay, for example, the word duct, a duct is a, like a drain. Okay, so e do sere, bring out, bring out the goodness in us. That's, that's real education. This is Buddhist education right now, right here. All right. If there's one thing in my life, I always love education. You know, teachers, some of these people, they become teachers, become scholars, they get all kinds of titles, they teach, then they retire to the garden. That's all finished. After that, you ask them, they forget things. But Singaporeans were reminded, you don't stop working until your last breath. <laughs> that is a wonderful advice. Otherwise, your life would not be purposeful. 
uh, if you start working a few more years life, you, you, you get uh, you go nuts no? right? you get dementia so you must keep your mind healthily active healthily active you cannot exercise so much you must still exercise it when you're old a little bit but your mind needs exercise through meditation through studying suttas the best is translating suttas if you can it's not easy but really enjoyable no? I've been translating suttas for this, this set for 16 years, you know. But then, even before that, I was already reading suttas. And imagine, 16 years, almost every day you translate suttas. You might say, wow, isn't that boring? People like to say boring, right? I mean, it's boring, you don't do that, you know, for 16 years. It must be fun. There is something interesting here. Maybe one day I will tell you more about that, interest, that, that interesting part, okay, bit by bit. So... Here you are, you have all these wonderful teachings. Then the next section, 1.4.5, the five rare, rare gems. Gems are jewels, precious stones. What are the five rare gems or five rare things? Okay, here again, look at the number. Ne? The sutta is called the Ratana Pingiyani Sutta. Okay, A5.195. So here... This is just an excerpt. I only take the teachings put here for you. These are five things which are rare. Number one, the manifestation of the Buddha, the Tathagata, the Arahat, perfectly self-awakened one. Or sometimes I use the fully self-awakened one. So this is rare. Why is the Buddha rare? Because... Uh, in one world cycle, usually you only have one Buddha. But in our present world cycle, in other words, our present uh, life of the universe, no? we have five Buddhas. We are very fortunate. This is called the, the fortunate Ian, the fortunate world cycle. Okay? We have uh, four Buddhas already passed. Okay, and then we have Sakyamuni, and one more Buddha coming, and then the world will end. Don't worry about end of the world. Long time, or you can't imagine the time. Very long time, right? So anyone goes around saying the world is going to end, say, oh, take a break. You know, not the Buddha hasn't come yet. Don't worry. Yeah? So we are very positive with people, huh? So uh, yeah, but the problem is uh, we're not keeping the earth very healthy, you know. So we've got to make sure this earth is healthy. Buddhists, the Buddha and Buddhists respect the earth very much. We love the earth. You know, one of the first things the Buddha did before, one of the last things that the Buddha did before he became Buddha was to touch the earth. Touching the earth is a very wonderful gesture. The earth touching gesture. There's even a word for it, it's called Bhumi Sampassa, Mudra. You know, you see it's a Buddha statue, the hand, you know, one hand go down, right? That hand is touching the ground. What does this mean? This is a very beautiful and important story for all of us. When the Buddha was sitting under, the, when the Bodhisattva is not Buddha yet, okay, he's still, he's going to be Buddha, sitting under the Bodhi tree, he's going to meditate, he found, he gave up extreme of pleasure, extreme of body torture, he found the middle way, he said, okay, now I'm going to meditate. I know I'm going to get the answer. It's going to sit and meditate. Then Mara appear. Mara is the distractor. Yeah? It's like you want to come here and join this class. Somebody tell, hey, don't go lah. Today we go and watch football or play mahjong. We just need one kaki. That's Mara, okay? So tell your friend, uh, please don't distract me. Another time, this time I won't have to come. Yeah? So uh, Mara appears to the Buddha and challenge the Buddha. Try to distract him so that he cannot meditate. So Mara challenged the Buddha. He said, uh, "What are you doing here? You know, you should be enjoying life. You look at you, so thin." And the Buddha was very thin at that time because he didn't take much food. He says, "You know, if you don't take food, you'll die. Take food, live healthily, then you can perform all these fire rituals and make marriage, and you'll be very happy as a layman." You know, and the Buddha said, "Oh, enough of marriage for me." I know what I, I want. I'm going to be Buddha. All right? Then Mara became very cunning and very bad. He says, okay, 
I don't think you have the right to sit down there under the Bodhi tree. Okay? This is my world. You have no right to sit there. Because the Buddha gets up with the tree, he doesn't meditate, get distracted, right? But nothing can move the Buddha, he's going to sit there. So the Buddha says, uh, what about you? You know, what merit have you done? Oh, but Mara is very cunning. Mara has got thousands of bad guys behind him, you know, a big gang. All the bad guys say, oh, we are his witness. They're all telling lies. <laughs> but the Buddha had no witness. Right? Mara is very cunning. Let's ask the Buddha, who are your witness? Who are the witnesses who have known, that, have known that you have done good, enough good to sit under the Bodhi tree, to meditate? Okay, this part of the story is very, very deep, you know. The fact that you survived today, you sat here without running home, is because you have done a lot of good things. A lot of things can happen, you know. Suddenly your phone rang and said, oh, you know, emergency and you have to go. But no, here you are sitting peacefully. Every time you come here, you can sit and meditate. That alone is because of your good karma. Don't take that for granted, you know. All right? So we, we try to use this chance we can as much as possible. Every month, how many times do you come here? Once, twice, you know, right? So, and to be able to sit here. So the Buddha remained on his diamond seat, as it is called, Vajrasana. Okay? The Buddha could not call anyone to witness. There are no living witness there. Even the gods got scared of Mara. The gods, the story is very funny. The story is the gods were very scared. They hide behind the rim of the world. They went out to the horizon and they were watching. Wow, this terrible Mara is they're scared of Mara, you know. So, who is the Buddha's witness? The Buddha only has one witness. We all have the same witness today. That witness is the earth. If you like, you can say Mother Earth. You know, because when the Buddha touched the earth, the story went, this, this very popular story in Thailand, Mother Earth, in Greece they call Gaia. Yeah? Mother Earth rose out because she is summoned, so she has, she has to come out, you know. Because we are talking about the Buddha to be calling Mother Earth. So she came out. And we're talking about this huge lady, you know, this beautiful woman. It's a, it's a deva, uh, the earth deity, came out from the underground. Underground, a lot of water. So she came out dripping with water, right? She rose, wow, imagine how high she goes, towering even over all Mara's army, all the bad guys, all the bad demons and so on. And she's flowing with water. The, the Thai, Thai version of the story is very beautiful. Then Mother Earth took her hair, long beautiful hair, you know, and twirl, twirl, and twirl, and the water gushed. We're talking about huge, you know, I don't know what size. you just got to imagine, you know, maybe think of Raffles Tower, you know, huge, you know. And you have this long hair, water gushing out, lots of water, you know. And the water flooded the whole place away from the Buddha and washed. Mara and all his demons away. Okay, this story is symbolic, you see. The water is all the good deeds you have done. You remember you do merits, you dedicate merits, you pour water, right? You, water of dedication, that kind of water. So if you have done a lot of good deeds, you know, you, you can hear the Buddha's teaching. You know, if you have done good deeds, many, many lives now. Wow, how much water have you poured? That's the water that will flow from Mother Earth's hair and wash away Mara and all the demons. So, this water of goodness will wash away all the bad things that try to trouble you. So Mara went away and the Buddha sat down, peacefully meditated and became Buddha. He called the earth to witness. We love the earth because of that. The earth represents our, the witness of all the good things we have done. Nobody may see us, but the earth is there to notice us. That's the meaning, our karma. The earth represents our karma. There's another saying. People think that they do bad deeds, nobody will know. Yeah? Nobody will know I'm doing this thing, that thing. Yeah? But the Buddha says, the devas will know. The, the devas are busy body, you know, they're up there, they can see you. You've got all kinds of sharp eyes and so on. They can notice you. And some of them are your relatives, you know. 
So they will keep an eye on you. So it is embarrassing if you do bad deeds. And your relatives remember. They don't, you don't see them, but they see you. <laughs> and then the other one is the Buddha. The Buddha also knows. Now the Buddha is not watching you, but when you meet the Buddha the next time, and you can't meditate, the Buddha look, looks at you and tells you a story. It tells a Jataka story in the past, all the naughty things, the bad stuff you did. Right? So remember, when we do something bad, something secret and bad, you, we think people do not know, but the devas and the Buddhas know. All right? So you can't run away from it. Right? So the Buddha is that kind of person, very rare, very wonderful. Only uh, in our times, we are lucky, we have five Buddhas. Other times, only one Buddha, sometimes no Buddhas. No Buddhas, wow, the world is going to be a terrible place, lots of violence. Okay? Number two, a person is able to teach the Buddha's teaching and discipline, Dharma Vinaya. Now, I only teach the Dharma, I don't teach Vinaya, see? So imagine if, if a, a monk can teach both Dharma and Vinaya, like Achan Sumedho, no? it would be very wonderful, you know? Okay? So, this is of course talking about a monk, but of course if you can teach the Dharma, that's wonderful too. So, to teach the Dharma, you must be prepared, you know? I mean, we can give talks, yes. But to talk Dharma is different. To talk Dharma means you must prepare your notes, you must quote the Buddha, whatever story you tell is connected with the Buddha. You don't talk other things which are not related, then it won't really help people. People will remember all the uh, jokes you tell, but they don't remember the good things you, you tell them, right? So, teaching Dharma, you, and then you want to make people happy so that you remember it too. But I think if you are serious, people will love the suttas. You know, I, I have this wonderful website, uh, French, what they call this, uh, uh, this Facebook, no? and we have lots of foreigners there, locals and foreigners, and they all love suttas. Some of them, they, they like suttas so much, you know, they say, please come to India, and please come to the Maldives, please come to Australia, and so on and so forth. I say, oh, no, no. I, I can't travel, you know, at this point. Because what you need is a sutta, not me, see. Because if I go there, I give talk, they, then they see me, they say, oh, it doesn't look that great after all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like writing my article, why teachers should never meet their students. <laughs> you lose your charisma that way, you know. So anyway the point is they need the dharma you need the dharma you don't need me the dharma is all there online anyone can download you want the latest one you write to me i'll send to you you don't, you don't need me or you can just come and, and learn something you have a seminar i will teach you i don't have to go right so here again we talk about dharma as refuge okay but then the people the, uh, people in Johor Bahru invite me. I say, okay, Johor Bahru is nearby, so you can just go over there. So people love the Dhamma. They say, wow, this is really beautiful. I've never seen this Dhamma talk like this before. Then they also want to know. So you got time, you join up this up my Facebook, you'll see it's a lot of Dhamma there. Yeah? The next one, three, a person who is able to understand this Dhamma Vinaya when it is taught. Wow, this is even the, the third wonderful thing. You can understand. Now, to understand something means what? That means you pay attention to it. I'm just like you. you know, the first time I came to Buddhism, I don't know what's going on. You know? And the things I thought also, I, don't, I can't remember. Them. There was nothing memorable. So, but I remember, there was this monk, he came with lots of Buddhist books, and oh, wow, I really loved those books. And I kept coming to see him, and we became good friends. And I make sure that I impress him, so I serve him, took care of him, so that I can access his books, you know. And uh, later, he gave me a lot of his books too, okay, when he went away. So, to be, to, to be able to learn is, is difficult, to be able to understand, even more difficult. And when I remember those days, I can understand, yeah, suffering, what is, suffer what is impermanence, what is suffering, right? The three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Suffering, uh, impermanence, suffering, non-self, well, very difficult to understand. So I asked this monk, I said, what's the meaning of this? Huh? And, uh, this monk, he's very good. Now, you just ask him one question, he'll talk for two hours. Now. So you just sit down and listen. Now. 
after a while, I told you, can I bring a tape recorder? It's easier, you know? <laughs> just see it and record, and then I go back and listen to it again. So, after he talked for two hours, I still cannot understand. Non-self, very difficult to understand. So I waited, I come again next time, make his favorite coffee for him and so on. That was that. He sit, I wait for him to sit quietly, relax. Then I ask him the my question, right? What is non-self? So I ask him like three, four times, you know? And every time he will give a, a long talk. Then slowly, slowly I begin to understand it. But still not completely yet, okay? So that's how we start. We go on asking questions. Right? So never run away. Because you run away, next time you become a farmer again, you know? You become a peasant again. You become un someone uneducated. Maybe you become a, I don't know, a Karanguni man or whatever. I mean, that's not very helpful, you know? So you got to want to study, want to learn, you want to educate yourself. You, you may not be a scholar, but you are wise. You know something, you know how to use that knowledge. And in, in Thailand, you know, you, you go to the roadside, they sell some tam, you know, all those uh, papaya salad and things on the ro nice food on the roadside. And then you see this lady selling all this uh, hawker ware, reading literature, <laughs> Thai literature, mind you. Very, Thailand is one of the most literate countries in the world. I think 90% literacy, not mistaken. Amazing, you know, those people there. And they've got beautiful literature. Their language is so beautiful that when I read the translation, you know, Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare, Merchant of Venice, and the Thai translation by one of their kings, the Thai translation is more beautiful because of the language, the internal rhythm, and so on. So, they, they, and Buddhism also enriched their lives in Thailand, right? So, we talk about culture then. All right, so the willingness to learn, very important. Eh? Then number four, a person does understanding it. So after you understand it, you practice it. The Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Notice, so now you learn the Dharma already, you learn about meditation, you learn about impermanence. You practice it as best as you can in keeping with the Dharma, not in the wrong way, that's the meaning. So practice, right? You put into practice, that's how you remember it. Because we are not here just to talk, you know. We are here to learn how to do it. It's like driving a car, you know. You can read as many books as you like, you still don't know how to drive a car, you must do it. Alright, so meditation is like that, you must do it. And then the last one, number five. A person who knows this, and joyfully reciprocates. Ah, there you are. This last one is about gratitude. So, we say, wow, this teaching is so wonderful. That is why my gratitude is to the Buddha. Whenever people say, wow, this sutta is wonderful. Huh? You have given this very wonderful teaching. I say, no, no, no. Please don't thank me. You must all thank the Buddha. Without the Buddha, there's nothing I can do. Right? Next time I do something wrong, they'll blame me anyway. You know, these people, people will praise you later also, will criticize you in a very nasty way. So I say, praise the Buddha, thank the Buddha. Remember, it's the Buddha's teaching. So that's the first one. Number two, joyfully reciprocate. Joyfully, re that means you feel joy and you continue studying. What's the best way to reciprocate, to return the favor? is to remember the Buddha's teaching and to make sure it continues even after we are gone. We go on teaching it, practicing it ourselves and showing joy. Very important to show joy to others. Go around, show you're happy. Then people ask you, why are you happy? And then slowly you tell us, you really want to know? Okay, practice loving kindness. And they say, wow, this is very nice, you know, can I know more? Okay, then breath meditation. So oh, very peaceful, and you want to know more. I say, okay, study suttas, Some bit by bit like that. You know, come to this blog you know, and study, come and join us. You know, very soon we need a big building. <laughs> so this is how we show our gratitude to the Buddha, to the teacher. All right? So there you are, these are the five rare wonderful things. Okay, perfect timing. Eh? My watch actually... 10 minutes earlier, but follow my watch now. Huh? So we'll have a short break here. Unless you have questions now, you can ask questions if you like. I'll take a short break. 
No questions, eh? Okay. Short break then. Okay. Right, next pitch, eh? Pitch 12, pitch 12, okay. Right, okay, now this is section 2. Even famous teachers can have wrong views. Alright. Now this is a very famous sutta, eh? You know the suttas, in the, in the sutta, the Buddha often tell us a lot of new things, you know, like, like, like a prophecy, like telling us what's going to happen in our time, right? So this is part of what I've said earlier, you take yourself as refuge, take the Buddha as your teacher, don't take anyone else as your refuge, because they are all not awakened. If they're not awakened, they're human, they make mistakes, then you might get upset, right? So even the most famous teacher in the world, they can call themselves all big titles and master this and master that. But if you know them well enough, you will see they are false, right? I, I hear a lot of this kind of story. For example, uh, there was one monk and then this lay person said, oh, this teacher is very good. But then the other one said, oh, no, I know him. I say, you know, one day I have to accompany him in the aeroplane, and I say, oh, he's a bad character, <laughs> and then was very unhappy. So, th that is why monks usually, they keep away from their people. One reason is not to be too close to them, and then they, they think they see their fault. Sometimes you think you see people's fault. Sometimes it's real faults, but either way, it's not helpful, right? So, if you take refuge in the Buddha, then you don't have to worry about it, right? Then the, sometimes, nowadays, even monks will learn from lay people. We are learning the Dharma. It's not, I'm better than you or anything like that. We're talking about the Dharma is our refuge. So here, we have one, uh, two, one, two. No? Here, there are five qualities, the Buddha says, that are not beneficial to the many. Okay, so those who have these five qualities are not helpful to other people. Okay, number one, uh, this is talking about famous monks. Okay, famous monks. Eh? You know, nowadays we, we have some really famous monks in the world. Now you see that even have fan clubs. You know, I don't know how monks can have fan clubs. So <laughs> one day I wrote a, a reflection. I said. Uh, why do you want to fan a monk, you know? You should be cool yourself, right? <laughs> no need to fan the monk, okay? If he's cool, you don't need to fan him. He's catch cold, you know? You be yourself cool, right? right? And it, if there's only, if you want to be a fan, there's only one person, that's the Buddha, you know? Right? One day you find fault with this monk, then you, you talk bad about him, right? So it won't be good, isn't it? So the Buddha is telling us, this is a reality check. Okay? Don't uh, follow human teachers. Follow the Dharma. Why? Because this famous teacher, look at 212. One, the elder is of long standing, long gone forth. You know, he's a very old man, you know, but still he may have mis faults. You know? He is well known, famous, with a following of great crowd of householders and renunciants. So, well, lots, thousands, even millions of followers, you know. He is recipient of robes, arms, food, lodging, and support for the sick and med medical requisites. Here, meaning he's very rich. He has all these things in the world. And nowadays, you know, monks can be millionaires, you know, can be very rich. He is deeply learned and expert a store of learnings. Sometimes they can even be very good in Pali, in suttas and so on. Many languages. Those teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, both in the spirit and the letter, in other words, both in meaning and phrasing, that affirms the holy life fully, complete and pure. This refers to the Buddha's teaching. Eh? Such teaching he has learned much, remembered, 
recited verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. In other words, he has mastered the, the Tibitaka and so on. Very good in suttas, very good in Pali. But, okay, now Pali, the suttas often have this kind of a, a climactic way of writing. Eh? You tell you all this nice thing and then suddenly bang. So, but, he is of wrong view and deviant vision. Okay? R- wrong view and his way of looking at things also very wrong. Okay? Having made the masses turn away from true Dharma, he establishes them in what is not true Dharma. So, this is uh, wrong teaching. Now, let me give you an example here. Now, I learned a lot of things about what's going on in other Buddhist countries through Facebook because I often get people from, say, Sri Lanka, you know, from Thailand, from elsewhere on our Facebook so that they will share their problems. Now, one of the interesting problems in Sri Lanka is the how to transliterate, in other words, change the Sinhalese words into English. And in Pali, you got C, CH, 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 and CH. Okay? CH, a light CH sound, that's a C, and then CH, CH. It's called a plosive. So, okay, you, you have the word anicca. Now, we all know the word anicca means impermanence, impermanence, right? Now, the problem in, in Sinhala, Sinhalese language, is uh, they think that, okay, you pronounce anicca, so you must spell it with a CH. Right? So this is a very common mistake. Well, a conundrum is not a mistake, because it's the way they spell it, you see. So the spell is A-N-I-C-C-H-A, Anicca, pronounced correct. Okay? But if you know the meaning, Anicca means impermanence, there's no problem. But it happened recently, this monk, for some reason, he looked at this word Anicca, you can pronounce Anicca also. He says, oh, this is interesting. Icha, I-C-C-H-A. Now, Icha means to desire something, to want something. So therefore, it concludes, Anicha means you cannot get what you want. Now, that part, I'm not sure how he reasoned, you know. He says, oh, Anicha doesn't mean impermanent, you know. It actually means you cannot get what you want. And then this makes many of those intelligent Singleists who know sutta scratch their head say, how, how do you understand this? You know? Then they ask me, I, and I say, well, there's no way it can be correct. Then I, I look at the spelling, I say, oh, this is a cultural problem. I say, it's your spelling. You've got to spell it correctly. It is not A-N-I-C-C-H-A. Remove the H. It's A-N-I-C-C-A. Then you won't have this problem. So when the Sinhalese man looks at the English, he interprets that back into Sinhalese, and they got this confused, confusing view, you see? and that creates problems. You see? And you know, when, when a man talks, well, people will listen. You see? So I have no choice but I have to be very clear. I said, no, I cannot agree with this because nothing in the sutta supports it. So you you got to tell your people, cor- make a standard way of. Transliterating uh, singly, singly alphabets into Roman in a clear way. I know as you get problems like this. So these are well known monks you know, talking about all this. Uh, they reinterpret all these suttas. It also shows that they didn't really study the suttas very well. That's another problem. So this is what the Buddha is warning us. Don't assume that because a monk teaches you is correct. That's why you got to know the suttas. It's not saying they always find fault with them. What we're saying is the final authority is always the suttas. Then you are safe. You don't simply follow the wrong teachings and then you, you start coming back, you have arguments with others in your own community and so on. Right? So this is what the Buddha is trying to prevent, not to spread wrong views. Okay. So... Here the Buddha is saying, don't think that just because a monk is very old, he's famous, he's rich, uh, he's learned, and so on, so because of that, he's right, not necessary. Okay? Even some <laughs> famous meditation teachers, you know, uh, one teacher once said, 
uh, oh, the, the, the Buddha discovered jhana. It, is, it started with the Buddha. Then I was scratching my head. I said, what, what I write in the suttas, this can't be so. Because uh, the Buddha practiced jhana even before he became Buddha. And then he went to other teachers. So I did not say anything. I went back to the sutta, did my research, and I wrote a like, 50-page essay. You know, and I said, I said, okay, this is what I think. Anyway, he, he said, he's too busy to read it. Okay, fine. You know? So <laughs> I just leave it like that. Then there were other monks who contacted me and said, you know, I'm a bit worried about this monk saying this thing. I, I don't think it's right. You know? They did not say more than that. They say, hey, don't tell people. Okay? I said, no, no, probably we all know what's going on. <laughs> So, he said, do you have your essay? I said, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like some secret underground thing, you know. So, I sent it to him. Then he replied, said, you know, I'm very relieved. I'm so happy to read your, your essay, your sutta, as, uh, your, your essay on the sutta. No, no, at least I know I'm not wrong. So, I'm happy too because there is this monk who, who plays a lot of premium, a lot of stress on the suttas and he knows the other monk uh, did not say this thing right but happily anyway that famous monk also stopped talking about that uh, wrong view after that okay so I suppose it's difficult for a famous monk to say it's wrong so that's, that's okay with me so but this is what this sutta is about saying that no matter how famous a teacher may be I mean I could be wrong myself then uh, I, that's why I'm always willing to listen to people say hey please proofread my suttas and, and give me a feedback so we can improve all these teachings. That's the difference with the Sutta Discovery series. So that's the meaning. Eh? Always take the suttas as the final authority. So that way you will not be disappointed. That's the idea. You get the true teaching. Eh? So don't go around saying, because my teacher says so. That's, that's called ad hominem argument. Ad hominem means personal. It's not strong enough. It's not good enough. Eh? Okay, so I think we will end here for today. Then we go on to a new chapter next lesson. And no, any questions? Yeah? Uh, no, part three. Okay, uh, yeah. You yeah. say always go back to the sutta, but how do you know the sutta is correct? Because some suttas are. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, that's another uh, very difficult question. Eh? Now we know. You must know the basic teachings, simple basic teachings, right? The first important basic teaching, we start with, uh, let's say, uh, n number three. Ne? We say, you got Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, right? Obviously, you must, the teaching must be connected with Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. We cannot reject the Buddha, we cannot reject Dharma, we cannot reject Sangha, meaning the, the four kinds of saints, right? Then there's another set of three, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness or suffering, and non-self. These are the three basic teachings. So anything goes against these three teachings, you know, it can't be right, right? Then you have the four noble truths, right? Suffering, arising of suffering, ending of suffering, and the path. So if you know these three teachings, or even one of set of these teachings and you hear someone talking you more or less will know you look at the sutta uh, the sutta talks about these things so you can be quite sure that it is correct uh, but it is always not that simple for example the latest sutta I'm working on it is A380 A3.80 A3 uh, where it talks about it says the Buddha the Buddha's voice can be heard over a three billion world system. Wow, that's quite amazing, you know. So, in fact, because of this sutta, some scholars think later Buddhist, post Buddha, Buddhists started talking that the Buddha has got all kinds of powers. We've got a different kind of Buddha, you know, the, the eternal Buddha. But if you look very carefully, the sutta also say how the Buddha does this. The Buddha didn't send out his voice from earth, not from under the Bodhi tree, not from uh, India. The Buddha, or the story actually is about another, another Buddha, 
the Buddha number five before our Buddha during that time, there was his chief monk, went to the Brahma world. That's the first jhana world, very high level. No? And from that world, this monk, he, he's a disciple, so his voice doesn't go very far. Only 1,000 world system. But the Buddha says, Buddhas can send their voice out to 3 billion world system. But if you look at the sutta very carefully, so I ask myself, where did the monk make his voice heard? It is in the Brahma world. And the Brahma world is the first jhana. All right? And then if you look very carefully at the Pali words, the Pali words doesn't say make his voice heard. This is the problem. A lot of translators, even the, uh, the, the best translation you've got now published commercially, the translator says make his voice heard. But there is no word heard in Pali. The Pali word is vinyapesi. Vinyapesi is a causative verb. That means make something happen. And it means make it known. The Buddha, through his voice, make it known. But make what known? So this is the trick, you know. I, 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 the reason I said, couldn't be make himself known because Buddha has never do that. I mean, what's the purpose of making Buddha known? I mean, it's always make the Dharma known. All right? Now, so you, you reason like that, it becomes clearer. The Buddha using his voice make the Dharma known over this three billion world system. And then after that, further down, the Buddha says, how does he do this? He shines his bright light. Now, then I almost laugh at myself. I said, the Buddha is pulling a 20th century joke here. You know, because when you say ra uh, radiance, eh, the word radio comes to my mind. Okay? Because radio and radiance, same meaning, you know, radiate. Eh? So it's this, as if the Buddha is talking to the future. The Buddha is saying, using radio waves, I can send my voice out to three billion world system and they can hear my teachings. That's one way we can understand it in our time. Okay? But of course, this is not the way they understand it in the Buddha's time. So I have to reason it again. So I say, what does it mean? I mean, it cannot be that the Buddha spoke so loud, his voice is so loud that three billion worlds can hear him. I mean, those people near him will go deaf, right? So it, it's not this physical voice. It is something to do with the mind. And then you come back to the Brahma world again, first jhana, very high level. Eh? What the Buddha is saying is, you, if you go into meditation, you'll be able to understand the Buddha's teaching no matter where you are in this universe. So, it's not an easy sutta to understand. You have to interpret it carefully, you have to reason it. So, anyway, that sutta is already online in, on Facebook. It's 14 pages long, everything is explained there what the Buddha meant by this kind of language. The Buddha always said, you must understand what I'm trying to say. So the Buddha is talking almost like a futuristic kind of language. There. He's saying that his teaching can be heard to that far. The voice here refers to his teaching, not his voice of the, the, the physical voice that we hear, like what you're hearing now from me. Okay? So we have to reinterpret the, some of the words in that way. So you've got to know your sutta well there. Right? So there are people who know suttas, you ask them, you examine, but not all suttas are difficult, thankfully. No? So know your basic doctrines, from there you can know whether the teacher is talking the right thing or, or not. Right? And then for other more difficult teachings, then you ask the experts, those who have done translations, the meditators, they will tell you further. Finally, your own authority. Now, it, it, the commentaries call this Atano Mati. Atano means self, Mati means knowledge. Now, this Mati is not Malay, it's Pali. No? Mati doesn't mean die, it means knowledge. Okay? Now, Atano Mati in Thai, it pronounces Atanomat, and in English, automatic. See, all very close, right? All these words. So, Atanomati means your own opinion. That is, after you study everything, you know it, and then you think for yourself, okay, what's the right thing here? Okay, so with your meditation, your Dharma knowledge, your precepts, 
you can do that. So in the end, you decide for yourself. Okay, because whatever you decide, you also bear the karma. So you, you must be wise. If you have no intention of deceiving anyone, you have no ill will. Even if you have wrong views, it's okay. But even if you have right view, but you have intention of deceiving people, it is wrong view, right? So your intention is very important. If your intention is pure, you don't have to worry, right? So this is the meaning. And we close on that happy note, right? So no more questions. Yeah? Let's close with a short reflection. Yeah? Now, at this wonderful moment, let us spend a quiet moment of peace to recall and remember this wonderful moment we have spent here. We have kept the precepts, the five precepts. So remember this. When you have kept the five precepts, then you feel good. It is good karma. Then it, it helps you in your meditation. We also have done some meditation. And we have studied the suttas. We have, we've done three wonderful good things. We have showed fellowship and so on. So these are all wonderful good karma we have done that brings us peace, that makes us a better person. This, by the power of all this good karma we have done today, and by the power of the three jewels. May we be blessed with good health, happiness, peace of mind and wisdom, and also the courage to aspire to at least stream winning to reach the path in this life itself. And by the power of the three jewels too, may our relatives and loved ones be well and happy. May they too see the Dharma in this life itself. And may those who are practicing the right way, may they too reach the path in this life itself. And by the power of the three jewels too, may those who are lost, who are teaching the wrong things, who have difficulties, may they, they too see the true teaching reach the path in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.